A very good afternoon, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and Ambassador at Large at the Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Professor Subhatra Kumar Mitra, Director at the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, Mrs. Rajshri Pathi, Chairperson CIA Southern Region, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISOS for short, at the National University of Singapore and our organizing partner, Confederation of Indian Industry, CRI, I warmly welcome you to this afternoon's Singapore Symposium 2015. The symposium is a signature event organized by the Institute, and today's session is a third in edition. The highlight of the Singapore Symposium 2015 is the interactive session with Singapore's Foreign Affairs and Law Minister K. Shanmugam, and a business forum precedes the interactive session with Minister. And to commence today's proceedings, it's my pleasure to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman of ISAS, to deliver the opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Good afternoon, Rajshri Pathi, Chairperson, CII Southern Region, distinguished panelists, Satpal Kata, Peter Ju, Mr. Pang, the ladies and gentlemen. Let me add my voice of welcome to what uh, Sitara had said earlier. Welcome to this third edition of uh, Singapore Symposium. The, the third one that we are having is significant in that this is the first one we are having outside Delhi. The first two were in Delhi. We had very distinguished guests of honor. The very first one held in 2009, the guest of honor was the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the founder, founding father of Singapore. The second one that we held was in 2012, and that the guest of honor was the Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sian Lung. The present one that we are going to hold is the chief guest is the Foreign Minister, Mr. Shanmugam. And I'm grateful to Mr. Shanmugam for being here in the second half. I think he will do the interaction after the business forum is over. My special thanks also to the panelists who are from major companies of Singapore and who have their experiences to, to talk about for this symposium. This, the choice of this year is very significant. 2015 is the 50th year of Singapore's independence. It is also the 50th anniversary of Singapore's relationship, diplomatic relationship with India. And it is the first time that we are having it in outside Delhi and in Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu, a state with which Singapore has got a very long, centuries-old relationship and the large number, the largest number of Indians uh, in Singapore, almost 60% of the Indians in Singapore come from this state or originated from this state. Singapore-India relations have expanded rapidly during the last couple of decades, with economic engagement playing the leading role in fostering ties. India's bilateral trade with Singapore was 17.1 billion US dollars in 2014. This was actually a dip from what it was in 2011, when it reached 25.2 billion dollars. That's the peak that we have ever reached. It's a very sizable number. 
Uh, we feel that with the growth, continuing growth of India, the relationship, the trade relationship will, will expand rapidly. Many Singapore companies are in India and in Chennai. The names such as Ascenders, Capital Land, DBS Bank, Suncorp, High Flux, Port of PSA, Port of Singapore Authority, Singtel, Tamasic, Singapore Airlines are uh, all invested in Singapore, uh, in India, and many of them are in Chennai. Most of these businesses, as I said, are located either western part of India or southern part of India. The Singapore is now the largest recipient of outward FDI from India. Indian investors have invested in Singapore, mainly to use that as a stepping stone for the rest of Southeast Asia. The large presence of Indian companies in Singapore marks the growing significance of Singapore in the business outreach and expansion plans of Indian corporates with respect to Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific. Let me now take a few minutes to explain Institute of South Asian Studies, since this is the first time we are having a function here. Founded in 2005 as an autonomous research institute within the National University of Singapore, it focuses on research on contemporary South Asia. The areas of focus primarily include economics, business politics, business, <coughs> politics, strategic affairs, and foreign relations of India and other South Asian countries. ISAS carries the role of well beyond that of a conventional research institute. It functions as a think tank on regional affairs. It also plays an extensive role in disseminating knowledge on South Asia in Singapore and vice versa. As a result, it facilitates the visits of distinguished experts on both sides for, for public lectures and interactions. It also organizes events on subjects that cut across various commute, communities and social groups, such as biannual conventions on the South Asian Diaspora Convention. The South Asian Diaspora Convention is another product that we have. We hold this once every two years. Actually, there should have been one this year, but we decided to postpone it to 2016 because of a very crowded calendar in Singapore because of its 50th anniversary. Today's symposium is an effective example of the role that ISAS has been playing both as a think tank as well as a disseminator of knowledge on Singapore and South Asia. There will be two components of the symposium, today's symposium. The first part is a business forum comprising eminent business personalities and practitioners from Singapore. And the second is a highlight, which is a highlight of the symposium, is the interactive session with our Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. K. Shanmugam. On behalf of ISAS, I express my thanks to Mr. Shanmugam for making himself available for this event today. I look forward like you all, to a very vibrant session during this uh, interaction. My special thanks to the person who is going to be the moderator of that session, that's Shyam Saran, who is the former Foreign Secretary of India. I must thank the Confederation of Indian Industries, CII, to be, for being so helpful in organizing this symposium. ISAS CII partnership goes back a, a very long way. We have had a very active association, and I look forward to further growth and extension of that partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let me welcome you to this symposium. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to invite Mrs. Rajshri Pathi, Chairperson of CRI Southern Re Region and Chairperson and Managing Director of Rajshri Sugars India, on stage for the Business Forum. Joining on stage are the following three successful Singapore businessmen from key industry verticals. Mr. Satpal Kata, Chairman of Kata Holdings Group of Companies. Mr. Peter Ju Hee Ng, Chief Executive PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency. Mr. Pang Yi En, Group Chief Operating Officer, Subana Jurong Private Limited. Could we have you on stage, please? Thank you. Mrs. Pathy, I hand over the session to you. Thank you. Okay. Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, Chairman IASAS, Professor Subrata Mitra, Director IASAS, Dr. S. Narayan, Senior Research Fellow, IASAS, Distinguished Delegates, um, Ladies and Gentlemen. At 50, according to George Orwell, everyone has the face he deserves. Singapore on August 9th marks its 50th anniversary as an independent country and can be proud of its youthful vigor. This year also marks the 50 years of the establishment of the India-Singapore diplomatic relations. And to commemorate this, a book was launched by ISAS on February 10th at New Delhi, aptly titled, Singapore India, a shared vision by the Singapore President, Dr. Tony Tam, in the presence of the Indian Railways Minister, Mr. Suresh Prabhu. As part of Singapore's 50th anniversary independence celebrations, ISAS has selected Chennai Tamil Nadu as the host for the Singapore Symposium 2015. Thank you very much for um, this uh, decision and choice. We are indeed very, very pleased to have you all here. Singapore currently has a population of 5.5 million and almost 8.5% of this population comprises of Indians and mostly from the uh, region of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. They've been settlers there for several decades. Bilateral trade and economic cooperation is a major pillar of the India-Singapore relationship. The Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, the CESA, became operational from August 1, 2005. Since then, both inward FDI from Singapore and outward FDI to Singapore have increased substantially. Bilateral trade expanded after the conclusion of CESA from US $6.65 billion in 2004 to 2005 to US $25.2 billion in 2011-12, but declined to US dollars $19.27 billion in 2013-14. Singapore overtook Mauritius in 2013 as the leading source of foreign direct investment into India. In 2013-14, FDI inflows from Singapore accounted for nearly a quarter of India's total, reaching a US of dollars 5.98 billion compared with US 2.3 billion in the previous year. Cumulatively, Singapore is one of the top source of foreign direct investment into India between 2000 and 2014, accounting for 12% of total inflows. Combined with an enabling environment, strong air connectivity, and the presence of a large Indian community, Singapore has emerged as an offshore logistics and financial hub for Indian corporate houses and proves to be more and more a natural um, partner. About 6,000 Indian companies are estimated to be registered in Singapore. I think um, the uh, ambassador had already mentioned, but once again, Nine Indian banks operate in Singapore, Bank of India, Indian Overseas Bank, Yuko Bank, Indian Bank, Axis Bank, State Bank of India, ICICI, Exim Bank, and Bank of Baroda. 
Agreements concluded between India and Singapore reflect the growing breadth of our cooperation and provide a larger framework of activities between the two governments, the business community, and people-to-people -people exchanges. The key agreements include Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement 2005, the Doubles Taxation Avoidance Agreement 1994, protocols were signed in 2011, Bilateral Air Services Agreement 1968, revised in April 2013, the Defense Cooperation Agreement 2003, MOU on Foreign Office Consultations 1994, Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty 2005, and MOU on Cooperation in the Field of Vocational Education and Skill Development, and very many more in the offing. Let me take this opportunity to wish you all the very best on your 50th year of independence and um, many prayers and best wishes from all of us here to ensure a very robust growth in your next 50. With these few words, I take pleasure in introducing the panelists. Mr. Ung, Chief Executive, uh, PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency. Mr. Ng leads PUB. He is responsible for the supply of portable water, reclamation and treatment of used water, and management of storm water in Singapore. He holds a concurrent appointment as the Deputy Secretary Special Duties at the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources. Prior to joining PUB, Mr. Ng helmed the Singapore uh, Police Force, SPF, as the Commissioner of Police for five years, from 2010 to 2015. He has held several key positions during his 29 and a half years career with the police. And um, Mr. Eng's public service appointments also included key positions at the Internal Security Department and Ministries. Mr. Eng was recipient of the SPF Overseas Scholarship. He read engineering science and economics at the University of Oxford, graduating with honors in 1988. He also received an MBA from the Nanyang Technological University and a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University in 2001. Um, the next um, uh, panelist is um, Mr. Pang, Group Chief Operating Officer, Surbana Jurong Private Limited. Before joining Surbana in uh, January 2013, Mr. Pang was in charge of real estate funds at Ascendas. He co-led the Ascendas team in the SGX listing of the Ascendas Hospitality Trust, which had a market value of over 700 million Singapore dollars. Prior to that, Mr. Pang was the Assistant Chief Executive Officer of Ascendas Services Private Limited. He oversaw the asset management of SNDAS industrial and commercial developments in both listed and non-listed entities in Singapore. In his capacity as head of SNDAS North India, Mr. Pang set up an SNDAS office in Gurgaon and oversaw 750,000 square feet of IT park space in the special economic zone projects located in Gurgaon, Nagpur and Pune. Mr. Pang was also previously stationed in Hyderabad where he led two major acquisitions of IT parks the V and the Cyber Pearl. The former was the largest real estate transaction in India then. Mr. Pang was also the CEO and co-founder of Abicha Private Limited, an e-business joint venture which he grew from a startup to a sustainable business. He graduated with a degree in electrical and electronics engineering from the National University of Singapore under a JTC Corporation Scholarship and he obtained a Master's of Business Administration from NUS. Um, last panelist is one of the most um, um, important industrialists um, in uh, Singapore, Mr. Satpal Qatar, Chairman Qatar Holdings Group of Companies. Mr. Satpal Qatar is the Chairman of um, Qatar Holdings and he's also Director of Harpaw Corporation Limited and Lee Kuan Yew Exchange Fellowship. He's a co-chairman of the Singapore India Partnership Foundation and life trustee of Singapore Indian Development Association, SINDA. Mr. Qatar is also a director of Gateway Distri Parks Limited, India, and the patron of the Singapore Indian Fine Arts Society. Mr. Qatar was a member of the Presidential Council of Minority Rights, member of the Public Services Commission, chairman of Guko Land Limited, director of Guko Group Limited, and founding partner of Qatar Wong. 
Mr. Carter was conferred uh, the Public Administration Medal in 1972 in, recogni in recognition for his contributions to the labor movement. Mr. Carter has been honored on a number of occasions at the May Day Awards. He received the NUTC Friend of Labor Award in 1979, Meritorious Service Award in 1887, 1987, the Distinguished Service Award in 1994, and the Distinguished Service Star Award in 2001. You may ask, is there more? Yes, there is more. In 2002, he received the Overseas Indian Award from the Priyadarshini Academy, and close to home, the Indian government conferred Mr. Cutter with the Padma Shri Award at, on, uh, at Republic Day, in 2011. We have a very, very distinguished panel. And now I request um, uh, Mr. Ung um, to start his presentation first. Thank you. There will be, after the three panelists complete their uh, presentations and talks, uh, we will open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Peter, Peter Juhi Eng. I am the Chief Executive of PUB Singapore. PUB is Singapore's national water agency. I want to spend the next 15 minutes that has been given to me to tell you the Singapore water story. The Singapore water story is how Singapore has successfully managed our water resources since independence 50 years ago. The moral of the Singapore water story, if there is one, is that it is possible to achieve water security even for a densely populated city like Singapore, which doesn't have enough water to start with. You see, it is often not the scarcity of water that is the problem, but the scarcity of good governance. With clear-headedness, political will, a plan, some imagination, and good execution, Singapore has shown that it never ever has to go thirsty. In the case of water, Singapore has managed to turn a disadvantage into opportunity and vulnerability into strength. Singapore is unique in the sense that it is both a city and a country. Singapore is a very small place, all of 710 square kilometers. It is smaller than the five boroughs of New York City or Greater London, and certainly smaller than the Chennai metro area. But a lot of people live in Singapore, five and a half million to be exact. And they use up almost two million cubic meters of water a day. To give you a sense of scale, that is about 760 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of water. The fact is that there is just not enough room in Singapore to collect and to store all the water that we need. So the first point I want to put across to you is this. Although right on the equator and in the tropics, Singapore is in reality a water-staffed country. But today's Singapore is not short of water. And if we do our work well, it should never ever have to go thirsty. Let me explain broadly how we have been able to achieve this. You will appreciate that water security is nothing less than existential for us in Singapore. Our continued existence as a sovereign nation is directly contingent on enduring water security. Basically, once the taps run dry, it will also be game over for Singapore. 
Singapore's continued ability to ensure water security and sustainability guarantees our national survival and economic prosperity. This was the case at independence 50 years ago, as it is today when Singapore turns 50. The late Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore's first Prime Minister, recognised this fact from day one and had worked tirelessly throughout his life to secure our water future. He had famously said that water dominated every other policy. Every other policy had to bend at the knees for water survival. Singapore's water strategy can be summarised into three parts. First, we have to maximise our own yield. We strive to collect every drop of rain that falls on Singapore. This means maximising as much of Singapore as a water catchment and keeping our drains, canals and waterways pristinely clean. Second, we have to think of water as an endlessly reusable resource. The H2O molecule is never lost. Water can always be reclaimed and retreated so that it can be drunk again. And PUB is a world leader in this. Today, we are able to literally turn toilet water into sweet water for very little money. We reclaim every drop of sewerage and turn most of it into drinking water again in the form of new water. And I've, I've brought bottles of new water to this conference at tea break as you make way out. You know, please uh, feel welcome to, to take a, a bottle with you. Third, because Singapore is surrounded by sea, we turn seawater into drinking water. So when membrane filtration technology made desalination economically efficient, we adopted it with great zeal. And we continued to research desalination technology to find even cheaper ways of desalting water. Our plan is for half of Singapore's portable water, water needs to be met by recycled water, another 30% from desalinated water and the rest by stored fresh water. The other secret to Singapore's water story is closing the water loop. And this is a picture of what I mean by the water loop. Let's start with rain. Rain falls and become stormwater. Stormwater is collected in drains, channeled to reservoirs and stored. Stored rainwater is treated to become portable water, which is supplied to people and to industry. And even as we supply good water, water that has been used is also returned to us. That used water is collected, treated and turned into good water again, to be supplied for human use or stored in our reservoirs. At the same time, seawater is desalted, turned into good water and fed into the loop. The water loop is simple, but it is still the norm in most parts of the world for it to be managed in separate pieces. In most places, the water department is separate from the sewage department, which is again separate from the drainage department. And invariably, all three work at cross purposes. Our trick in Singapore is to close the water loop and to manage this whole thing as an integrated system. In this way, we turn the water loop into a virtuous cycle. The organisation that I lead, PUB, is Singapore's national water agency and the sole water utility in Singapore. Our mission is straightforward. In the PUB, we do three things and three things only. One, we supply good water. Two, we reclaim used water. And three, we tame storm water. PUB manages the entire water loop in Singapore. As such, PUB operates waterworks and a reticulation network that brings portable water to every customer. We also operate the sewage system that collects liquid waste 
and brings it to the water reclamation plants for treatment. And PUB builds, operates and maintains drains and canals which channel stormwater for storage in our system of freshwater reservoirs. Operating, maintaining, sustaining and improving this expensive and critical infrastructure is the responsibility of the dedicated men and women of the PUB. This is a responsibility that my 3,400 hardworking colleagues execute every day with pride and dedication. By supplying good water, reclaiming used water and taming stormwater, they make everyday life possible. And because my officers take their work seriously and work hard at it, they also help to make a successful and prosperous Singapore possible. In the PUB, our vision is to work towards a future where Singapore will always have enough water and where every Singaporean will cherish every last drop of water. So far, I've only described the supply side of the water house, but a properly functioning water market also requires an efficient demand side. First and foremost, no one should be incentivized to waste water. Water is such a scarce resource that it must be conserved as much as possible. I have no time to talk about all the measures that we have in Singapore to encourage our customers to save water. But I will speak a little about the most important conservation measure of all, and that is the proper pricing of water. Water pricing is perhaps the most difficult and contentious policy for countries, states, cities and water authorities all over the world. In Singapore, we have decided to take a hard-headed approach to water pricing. The price of water in Singapore is the price of producing the next drop. In other words, price is set to long-run marginal costs. This approach may be textbook economics, but it is very hard to implement. And not many countries have managed to price water properly. But by doing so, the scarcity value of water, of every drop of water, is fully priced in. And there are no subsidies at all for water in Singapore. While preparing for this presentation, I looked up Chennai Metro Water's website to check the tariffs that they are charging for water in Chennai. And I, I then made, made up this table comparing prices here in Chennai and in Singapore for piped supply to metered residential customers. You can see that portable water is 3 to 30 times more expensive in Singapore. I do not know what Chennai Metro Water's cost structures are, but looking at the prices, I suspect that there are heavy subsidies built into the water tariffs here, especially for the initial blocks of consumption. I have described how we manage the water system in Singapore so that we can guarantee that everyone in Singapore have enough clean water, that wastewater is collected and properly treated, and that storm water is properly channeled and stored. And I think we have a good system in Singapore. But we also know that if we just do more of the same, the next drop of water will always be more expensive to collect to treat and to deliver. So PUB is always looking for new ways of doing things, new innovations that will let us produce life-giving water cheaper and in an easier way. Because the heavens do not give us enough water or the space to keep it, we have to look to clever science and high technology and to human ingenuity for improvements. We recognize that it will be high technology and clever innovation that will allow us to continue providing the water that our customers need and that will allow us to make a profit on our operations. And it will be technology and innovation that will allow us to collect and clean our wastewater and therefore continue to keep our soil, our rivers, lakes and seas cleaned and habitable. 
And in Singapore, we are crystal clear about achieving three outcomes for water sector innovation. One, increase our water resources. Two, lower the cost of our production. And three, improve our quality and security. And in order to achieve and, ach and sustain these outcomes, we have invested a lot of money in water-related scientific research. We have nurtured human talent in water technology and engineering, and we have actively developed a thriving water industry. Today, Singapore is a world leader in water husbandry, and Singaporean companies bring class-leading capabilities to the global marketplace. At this point, I, I want to say a few words about the burgeoning water industry in Singapore. Beyond managing the water cycle, PUB is also the primary cheerleader for Singapore's thriving water industry. Together with other parts of government, PUB works hard to attract international water companies to set up shop in Singapore, to groom local champions, to incubate innovative technologies, as well as to bring Singaporean water companies overseas. Singapore has become a global hydro hub, and the numerous water-related businesses and companies located in Singapore form an important part of our larger green industry complex. Over 180 water companies and 26 R&D centres call Singapore home, and they have been very successful. I'm sure that they are keen to work on projects in India and to bring the expertise and technology and to help solve some of India's water problems. I want to finish my presentation by making a pitch for the Singapore International Water Week. The Singapore International Water Week is an event that we organize every other year in Singapore. And the next one will take place 10 to 14 of July next year. The Singapore International Water Week is now one of the most important water convention and exhibition for the world water industry. It has become a preferred gathering for thought leaders and practitioners in water management from governments, industry and academia the world over. The last Water Week in 2014 saw 20,000 people from 133 countries come to Singapore. US $10 billion in new business was also announced at the last Singapore International Water Week. And I'm co confident that next year's Water Week will turn up even better outcomes. As was in 2014, Singapore International Water Week will be held alongside the World City Summit and the Clean Enviro Summit Singapore. Together, these three conventions present a most compelling destination for anyone responsible for maintaining high-functioning cities or have a stake in creating sustainable urban growth and development. I welcome all of you to mark your calendars and come to Singapore next July for the Singapore International Water Week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ong. Um, now may I request uh, Mr. Pang to make his presentation. Ilulukum Vanakam. Recover master planning, the key to successful cities. As all of us know, success in city building has a lot of factors from governance to infrastructure, the economic, the, the culture, and so many other factors. But what happened is that what you need is a good master plan to bring together all those factors both physical and non-physical. I shall illustrate this with our success in Singapore in master planning. All of us know, 50 years ago, Singapore was challenged with the, all the difficulties from economic, social, and environment. 
the British troops were pulling out of Singapore, giving us 20,000 jobs less. We have problems with slums and insufficient housing, and we have a poor uh, infrastructure to support the growing population. And now, with master planning, let's look at, take a look at what the current situation. On your left is the Singapore River in the late 1960s. All right, it's a, it's a place where it's part of our port activity in the heart of the city, giving us a lot of constraints and creating a fair amount of environmental problems. On the right is what it is now, Marina Bay. Uh, Mr. Ng will tell you that it's part of his reservoir now. All right, uh, he has a barrage that stops the water in front of it. All right, and it's providing clean water. And at the banks right now is financial center that drives the heart of Singapore's financial services. Another change, Orchard Road. A lot of us are familiar with Orchard Road shopping, right? How is it possible that it's eight kilometers from the city center then, which is quite a far distance then, all right, could turn around to be a retail center if not for the conscious master planning of it? Connectivity in Singapore to the external world is so important, all right? Changi Airport is where our visitors land and leave, and that's an important hub for us. And we manage that fairly well with the master plan that comes along, which I'll illustrate later. It's not just about airports, it's about the seaports, it's about the telecoms and internet connectivity, and so on and so forth, that we put together. And therefore, Singapore was able to come high in the global rankings, uh, just to name a few there. All right, I shall not go through. Building cities. So how do we do the master plan? 50 years ago, our pioneers in Singapore did not have a privilege of interesting concepts such as sustainable cities or smart cities, but they only have the guts and the wisdom to put all this together. All right, 50 years later, we'll attempt to put the concepts around it so that we can learn from it and replicate. First, we make our city sustainable. When we say sustainable, number one, it has to be economically sustainable. It must have the economic driving force. Singapore has moved from a labor-intensive industry to technology-intensive to knowledge-intensive, bringing all the petrochemical, the financial services, the life sciences technologies, into Singapore and evolve from there. And all this is part and parcel of growing and evolving out of the city. The social fabric, I mentioned about insufficient housing. Now we have one million homes, public homes, for, to house the 80% of Singaporeans, which uh, I don't see any countries coming close to us. All right? and, and the slums are an issue of the past. The environment, before the world gets uptight about the environment, Singapore was pursuing the garden city concept on its own. And we are pursuing the infrastructure strengthening like uh, what Mr. Ng mentioned earlier on, as, especially some of these key matters like water sufficient, sufficiency. So with a, sufficient, uh, with a sustainable platform, it ensures the quality of life and the growth of the city. Then we make it smarter. How do we make it smarter? We plan in such a way that cities are distributed. We are satellite towns so that people don't travel to the inner core of the city. We have enough connectivity and infrastructure to support the growth of the country. And we put in IT systems to run our traffic network, to run the 23 and a half thousand lifts that in our public housing. All, all this at very precise uh, control. That will give us the efficient and the effectiveness that we needed. The third layer is the ability to self-renew. Our land policy, for example, encourages self-renewal. Our infrastructure, we look ahead what is, what is needed for us tomorrow. We look, in the, we look into next 20 years if the well, uh, sorry, takes uh, next 30 years 
All right, when the, when the tide, water tide rises by 20 centimeters, what will be our coastal uh, profile be? And we make pro provisions for it. These are the self-renewal process that we constantly ask ourselves and we continue to get better so that we are future ready and future proof. And that adds on ultimately a quality life, a lifestyle and continuous growth. What is this master planning? What you're looking at right now is the first official version of a master plan, 1971. After that, every 10 years, we do a major revision. And every five years, we, we review it again. All right, such rigorous master planning process ensures our uh, ability to keep, make sure that our master plan keeps up to its challenges. Please uh, bear with me. You look at the red dots. You can see that the whole entire concept is about zoning, very broad zoning. And most of it are kept the way it is till now. For example, to the west of Singapore, that's where the, 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 the industrial parks are. All right? And you have major spines that connect up Singapore, including the metro. In 1971, we have planned that. All right? And you can see that we have a port down south of Singapore, where the heart of the city is. We have already talked about the greenery, that we, the greenery and the reserve that we have to contain, to maintain the kind of water and the kind of space that we need. 20 years later, the master plan looks like that. Obviously, more granular. You can tell a lot more detailed planning down to each plot with precision. In the broader sense, you can tell that the industrial uh, growth is requiring more space. All right, we, amalg we have the intent at that time to amalgamate the islands down south to make sure we create a petrochemical hub called Jurong Island. We have also created a new space for the airport if we intend to shift the international airport out to the east to make sure that the central corridor of Singapore is not obstructed by the flight height, flight constraints. And again, the green and the water is at the heart of our planning and the city is beginning to spread north, east and westwards. 2001 master plan. Wow, you can see the amount of residential arising from the growth of a population uh, is quite obvious. And you can see a lot more reclamation in the east, south, and to the west. It shows the strain on our limited land resource, and we, are, we, and we have to look forward to make sure that in the future we are, we are land sufficient. In particular, you will see that the Tuas area on the extreme west has gone on a massive expansion because we are trying to move the port down south to the west, to what we call as a west coast, and further west to the Tuas. So such evolution of planning takes place every time. And this is the concept plan for 2011, which was uh, recently in the midst of being reviewed, as I mentioned, the time frame I mentioned. All right, you can see the formation of a larger industrial area, the formation of better defined towns with industrial support, and a larger airport region, which we are building a Terminal 5. These are only the visual, uh, what you can visualize from, from the master plan, but the softer side of infrastructure and other forms of support are also part of this plan, which I cannot illustrate uh, from just pl this plain view. Plan view, all right. So you can, the point here is about a master plan consolidating across departments, across ministry, from the government to the private, and down to the individuals are affected by this master plan. Allow me to carry it a little further to talk about the master planning of new towns in Singapore. 
New towns are an important part of master plan in Singapore. And look at this uh, illustration here. From our experience, a new town has a diameter of two and a half to three kilometers. All right, with a town center marked in blue, supported by neighborhood center marked in orange. And then that in turn is supported by the purple circles, what we call as precinct. One precinct is in the range of 300 to 700 dwelling units. And therefore, when you work it out, a new town size is in about 30 to 60,000 dwelling units. And this may look like mundane figures, but these are important for planners like us because we're going to plan all the amenities around it. We're going to plan the schools, the fire stations, the post office, and so on and so forth, and, and the parks and the green spaces that we come along. For example, schools. Every 3,000 homes, we have one primary school. 5,000 homes, we have one secondary school. All right, these are tested principles based on our population, our culture. And these are things that we evolve and we get better and better at it. Example of a new town place plan on these standards is Tampines. Uh, those of us who had uh, stayed in Singapore before, you'll know that Tampines is quite a pleasant town. All right, uh, it is a, a second generation town that emerged. What you can see, the blue center here, as part of the MRT, the, the metro track, that is the center, the town center, supported by the neighborhood and the precinct. In between, whatever is marked green are the parks that we ensure uh, the, the green spaces. And if you can drill down to each, you can actually tell uh, the individual blocks that is being planned um, to that level. You may find that we are paranoid with planning, but that's how we get our precision correct. And there you have Tampines, the winner of the World Habitat Award in 1991. All right, it is still evolving. The town center is still evolving and it's getting an even better place to stay. The price of the HDB flats or the housing development block flats have gone up four times since the inception of Tampines. Based on the knowledge that we have built over the years, Sabana Jurong brought all these good principles out to more than 250 cities in the master plan, which includes uh, Rwanda. We planned their capital city, Kigali. They, we helped them with, uh, to build a financial district. They aim to be the financial center for Africa. We are very active in China, all right? And this is a little town. I brought this up because it's so little that I thought it's meaningful. All right, it's a little town that is uh, propelled by the economic uh, its cap capability as a textile center for China. All right, so with its economic driver, how we maximize their value, all right, and build an environment uh, for them, which includes a neighborhood center with all the convenience of amenities uh, uh, as, as if it's a Singapore township. All right. Um, last but not least, our latest work, uh, the Andhra Pradesh Master Plan. That's our Amaravati, capital city for AP. Where we focus on smart design around the constraints of land acquisition and the terrain. How we maximize the land. We make sure that the economic sustainability Sustainability comes off as, come off as priority given there is a greenfield development, all right, and the connecting infrastructure that it is needed for its growth. And all this, uh, we adapt our way of planning, a very pragmatic way of planning with no uh, super high rise building to, to color the skyline, but very practical way to solve all the problems on the ground. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Spang. That was quite a fascinating presentation. We'll come back to, to it during the question and answer session.